inspirational. I'm going to say the good morning, good morning, because that tells the people that finish off the video for everybody to watch it. Okay, this is where they start the recording at. Um, hey, I'm glad to be back. We had a, a phenomenal time in Romania. If you want to hear about it, you got to come back tonight. Because the Romanian team is taking the entire service. Pastor Jerry has the night off. He's going to sit and listen as well. And do we have some stories about uh, what God is doing in Romania and the Ukraine and the believers we walked into, you know, met? And we just, you know, I can't encourage you enough. If you're not a regular Sunday nighter, this is one of the Sunday nights of the year that you're going to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to go tonight because. Um, kind of like the old Grinch story, your heart will grow three sizes by the time uh, we're done there. But um, I'm excited to be back. I'm really excited about our summer series. Um, I am just jazzed with this thing. Um, it, it's designed in such a way that I know that summer people are coming and going, so it's not particular linear. One week doesn't depend on the next, but um, I'm several weeks ahead in my plotting and planning and, and lesson forming and I'm just going, oh, this is good. <laughs> you guys are just, if you get half of what I've gotten out of it already, um, you're just going to thoroughly enjoy this thing. So, um, and hopefully we're going to kind of look at some scripture that some of you are familiar with that you've seen before and look at it in a whole new, whole new way. So with that, um, Steve, would you open us in prayer this morning? Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. We thank you and praise you, Lord, for allowing us to gather one more time, Lord, in, in your house and to study and worship your word. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for the answer of prayers this past week and the week before of the uh, mission team going in and coming, Father, that uh, they were safe. But Father, they are tremendously blessed and overflowing, Lord, with uh, stories that they'll share tonight. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for, um, for the answer of prayer, Father, for your promise that you'd always be with us and you would never forsake us. Father, I just pray this Memorial Day, Father, this, as we set aside uh, time to uh, thank those, Lord, that give the ultimate price for our freedoms, Father. We just, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to uh, remember, Lord, your cross is the ultimate memorial, Father, that freed us from our sins. So, Father, I just pray, Lord, that, um, Lord, that as we as we go and and um, and go about our uh, activities this week, Father, may Christ be seen in us, Lord, that the, this uh, ever increasing dark world, Father, it does have a hope, Lord, and and that hope lies in you. I pray, God, that you be give each and every one of us the strength, Lord, to. Uh, to stand when we need to stand and to confess when we need to confess. Thank you, Lord. I pray that you give, uh, that you uh, anoint Harry with the Spirit, Father, that that uh, your word will flow and that it may be received with open ears. Thank you, God, for loving me. Thank you for my salvation. We give you the praise in Christ name I pray. Amen. Amen. So as, as you can see on the board and on your, your papers, I've titled this Jesus and the Psalms. Um, in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, oh, and before I go any further, Scott, I want to say thank you for uh, taking the last two weeks. Um, I can't tell you as a teacher how important it is to know that you have some godly people that you can turn to, uh, and I have, I'm, I'm blessed, I've, I've got three or four um, that I can turn to at any time and say, you know, I'm, I'm going to be gone, or I need the, the week off or whatnot. So uh, again, Scott, just thank you for, for doing that. I, I know the care and time and effort that he put into it. Um, so, but in, in, the, in the Gospels that cover the life of Jesus, we see him quote scripture a lot. Um, of course, what he's quoting scripture, what do we refer to that as? The Old Testament, right? Yes. The New Testament hadn't been written yet. He's still... He's still alive. He's still going through his life. So when he quotes scripture, he quotes the Old Testament. So for any modern day Christian that isn't living in the Old Testament in your Bible study, you are missing out on what Paul, Jesus, Peter, John, all the other great writers depended on for scripture. And Jesus quoted it a bunch. 
One of the books that he quotes and refers to the most is the book of Psalms. And you find that kind of interesting, really, at first, because Psalms are songs. They were sung. They were set to music. And yet, we know that they are scripture. They are God's inspired word because Jesus quoted them on a very regular basis. Jesus, in fact, has 18 different quotes or allusions to passages from 14 different Psalms. We're going to look over this over the summer. We're going to look at those particular Psalms because there's, you know, literally, if you want to study the book of Psalms, that would be about a two year Sunday school <laughs> run <laughs> without a break and then you'd still be short. Um, so we're going to focus on those Psalms that Jesus quoted. And that's going to kind of what this summer study is going to, going to look at. We'll also, of course, examine Jesus' quote and what's going on in his life at the time. Because when he quoted that Psalm, his audience at the time would have said, oh, that's Psalm 6. Boom. And they know what that Psalm had said. So to take a verse out of it when Jesus quotes it, in the mind of his hearers, they're now going to review that entire song in their head. Because when you hear a quote from a song that you know real well, what do you do? Sing the whole song. You sing the song in your head. Absolutely. All of a sudden that whole song starts rolling through your head. And if it's really bad and becomes a mind worm, it stays there all day. <laughs> The Psalms are quoted by a number of writers in the other New Testament epistles, but we're going to limit ourselves just to the interaction that Jesus had with the book of Psalms during the summer series. And again, as you're traveling, of course, we record each week, so you don't have to feel like you miss out on Tuesday or Wednesday. You can hook onto the church website, and if you want the handout, the handout is on the church website. You can print that up somewhere. If you're a person that loves the handout, if you're a person that doesn't, you don't have to print it up. <laughs> but you can then listen to the class and follow along and, and stay up with it as well. So as you travel, you can still be a part of what's going on. So really what this study is intended to do, and any good teacher will tell you, here's what you're going to learn, or here's what the purpose of the class is, so you know where you're going ahead of time. In fact, is public speaking, and when I've taught public speaking, one of the things I teach the class is, you're gonna say the same thing three times. You're gonna tell them what's coming, you're going to tell them the information, and then you're going to review what you just told them. Here's what's coming, here's, here's the information, now let's go back and look at it. So essentially three times in three different ways. So what I wanna do is start by telling you, here's where we're gonna go, here's what you're gonna get out of, and basically just two things. First off is to, I'm gonna, we're gonna show how Jesus used scripture to address all kinds of situations in his life. So when various and sundry situations come up, and generally we're talking tough situations, I. Very rarely do I see people suddenly quoting scripture when it's all happiness and rainbows and flowers in their life. <laughs> it's not a bad thing to do. But generally when things in situations and how Jesus used scripture um, in situations of life, of course if Jesus used God's word in this way, then shouldn't we do it as well? If God's only begotten son used scripture to address a situation, that's probably something we should be doing. And the other, the other thing that this study is intended to do is to give us a desire to get in and study all 150 psalms. You see why this would be a, you know, a two-year study or more than if we were to do psalm by psalm by psalm each week. And hopefully getting this taste of a few of the psalms and seeing how Jesus used them and how they applied to real life will give you that desire. Say, so you know what? In class, we only hit this psalm and this psalm and this psalm. I want to go back and look at all of them. I want to study all of them and see what, see how they apply and see how I can use them in our in my life. Remember what Scripture says about itself. Second Timothy three sixteen says this: All Scripture, and again, when the Bible says all, what does it mean? 
Oh. Yeah, it means all. Unlike our use of the word all, which is a throwaway word, well, he was all man. <laughs> when scripture says all, it means all. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. So the Psalms are effective to do all of those four things. And Hebrews 4.12, the book right next door, kind of finishes our thought with this. For the word of God is living and effective and sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating as far as divides soul, spirit, joints, and marrow. It is a judge of the ideas and thoughts of the heart itself. So if scripture has that kind of level of importance and Jesus is using it for all kinds of things, that's, that's kind of the purpose of, of this entire study and, and what I think that we are going to get out of it. In facing the difficulties of life, anybody faced any difficulties in life and say, well, I don't know, the last week, <laughs> the last month? In facing those difficulties, or maybe you haven't had any difficulties, but maybe you've had a, some difficult people in your life. Anybody had any difficult people? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to ask for a definition of what a difficult person is, but they're there. A lot of times it's family, which makes it even more fun. But in addressing all of these things, why wouldn't we want to be armed in this way with Scripture for what we have to face? Jesus found it to be the absolute best way to deal with difficult people and difficult situations. So that's kind of what this study is intended to do, and really, it's a wet your appetite study. We're going to get some great stuff out of it. <laughs> I can't deny that at all. But hopefully, after we've hit these few, you're going to go back and say, man, I'm dedicating the rest of 2022 to... to studying the book of Psalms. I'm going to really dig in and find out what God has in there. So let me start by way of an illustration of particularly the, the psalm that we're going to be looking at, which is Psalm 6, called The Mercy Shot. A story is told of a high school basketball player whose mom, after a long illness, passed away early in the morning, late at night, early in the morning, on the day of a game for this young high school boy. He ended up making it to the game that evening, but he was late. And his coach invited him to just come and sit on the bench, but he wanted to play. You know what? My mom's finally at, at home. She's finally at rest. I want to play. I, I need the catharsis of getting in there and running some energy off. Since he arrived late, though, he wasn't on the original roster. And putting him in the game, and as a former basketball coach and basketball player, I know this to be true, if you put that person in the game, it's a technical foul. It's two shots for the other team. The coach said, okay, I'm going to put you in, but it's going to cost us. Now, the interesting thing is that the other team had heard the story about what happened to the player from the other team. They knew that his mom had been dying for a long period of time and that it finally happened, yet here he was that night. He went into the game, referee blew the whistle, technical foul, two shots. And the opposing team refused to shoot. No, I ain't, I ain't shooting that shot. But the ref said, look, the game's not continuing. This is a technical foul. Those shots have to be taken. So the opposing coach said to his team, okay, who's going to take these shots? Finally, the team captain, best shooter on the team, steps forward and said, I'll take the shots. So they line up. And if you know anything about basketball, you, you're in or dispersed on either side. you got your shooter at the line. He's got the ball. He's ready to go. He takes his first shot. It goes a whopping two feet. Oops, missed. Referee hands him the ball. 
His second shot goes about a foot. Technical fouls have been satisfied, and the game goes on. What the opposing team did was show mercy. They could have taken their shots. They sent their best shooter to the line. That's too easy. And again, as a basketball coach, let me tell you, I, I, I coached two shots. The layup and the free throw. If you hit those, you will win your games. Now, everybody loves the three from long distance. Everybody loves the tail. That gets everybody up and screaming. I will beat three point shooters and jammers all day long if you give me a team of guys that can hit 90% of their free throws and 90% of their layups, and I'll beat them every time. And they said, we're not going to do that. We are going to show mercy to this guy by sharing his pain with an act of kindness. So we're going to be kind of talking about mercy today because that's what Psalm 6 is really all about. So again, since you are, most of you are very regular to my class, what do I always do when I give a word? Definition. Yeah, because I want us all to understand the word the same way. Absolutely. I don't want 25 different definitions of mercy out there. So out of the Holman Dictionary, Bible Dictionary, here's what the definition of mercy is. It's a personal characteristic of care that meets the needs of others. So it's an action thing. It's not a feeling thing. It's very akin to love, isn't it? Yes. It's another action. Mercy is a personal characteristic of care for the needs of others. So the biblical concept of mercy always, and I mean always, involves help to somebody who is in need or somebody who is in distress. Mercy and acts of mercy should be a hallmark of a church. This is one thing that Levine Baptist does pretty well. Do we have room for improvement? Yes. Absolutely. But I tell you what, if somebody's in need here, and it doesn't have to be a member, I've watched this church when an, a need is identified or somebody's with, that this church jumps up and says, how can we meet it? And goes crazy. Often, oftentimes to the point where I've gotten emails or calls back to the office, could you turn off the spigot? <laughs> I can't eat anymore. <laughs> I don't need anymore. That's the way it should be. But that's the definition of mercy. So with that, let's look at the psalm first, which is Psalm 6. It's a super long psalm. It's 10 whole verses. Would you read Psalm 6? Sure. And you guys can read along with it. O oh Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chase me in your hot displeasure. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. O oh Lord, heal me, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled. But you, O oh Lord, how long? Return, O oh Lord, deliver me. O oh, save me for your sake, mercy for your mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In the grave, who will give you thanks? I am weary with my groaning. All night I make my bed swim. I drench my couch with my tears. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows old because of all my enemies. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Hold on. That is one of my favorite phrases in scripture. <laughs> workers of iniquity. Go ahead. For the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all my enemies be ashamed and greatly troubled. Let them turn back and be ashamed suddenly. Wow. So, kind of an overview of those ten verses we ju just read. David, notice that David doesn't ask for immunity. He doesn't say, hey, Make me immune from judgment. He just, he's asking God to temper the judgment that he's probably, he probably justly deserves with mercy. In our illustration today, did the opposing team get two free shots? Yes. There was judgment. You weren't on the roster. You showed up late. There is a penalty to be paid. But he said, God, please, in your judgment, 
Show me some mercy as well. He admits his weakness. He admits that he needs healing. That is so evident that he describes it. And David always, he's a great writer. His, his images are vivid. And he said, so much so that his bones and his entire being is shaking. Some of you may be able to even relate to that. You've been so sorrowful. Something's happened to the point where you're just quivering. Or you've had such fear come into your life. Something so bad has happened and death is so imminent that it has left you shaking. And he's given this word, this word image into your mind saying, this is where he's at. This is the guy, by the way, that took on a 10 foot giant with a sling and enough stones to take out the giant and all of his brothers. You all know that, right? He took five stones. That wasn't a case he missed, that he had four more shots. He knew one stone was going to, in the hands of God, one stone was going to take out that giant. And he knew the giant had four brothers. And in that culture of the day, the brothers are going to come. So he's got one stone for each. God's got me one stone for each of you big boys. This is the same guy who's writing this saying, I'm down to the point where I'm shaking. Then he asks the question that we all want to know in these kinds of situations. When we're in a tough spot, when things are horrible, when things are bad, when things are just out of control, how long is it going to last until we experience God's mercy? Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Anybody that's not nodding your head, at least in your head, you're a liar. <laughs> because we all say, God, how long? How much more is this going to go on? And then generally followed by the phrase of, I can't take any more. I'm done. That's where David's coming from. How long until we experience God's gracious hand of mercy? Now, having admitted his position, David then asked to be rescued. All right, God, this is where I'm at. Now, does God already know where he's at? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes. But he had to get out of his own pride and say, this is where I'm at. God, this, I got nothing. I'm, I'm shaken. I'm a mess. My enemies are all around me. How, how am I going to, where is your mercy coming now, he asked to be rescued, not, notice, not because of anything that he's done, but because God is faithful. God, I, I want you to rescue me, not because I'm such a cool guy and I've done wonderful things for you, but because you are a faithful God to me. I want you to rescue me because of who you are. Really, when you think about it, what is he asking for? All of this is just a synonym for salvation. I want you to save me. I can't save myself. He's asking God to draw him out, to graciously extricate him from trouble that he's gotten himself into. And then he gives a reason... <laughs> And I know this is more for his own thinking than for God. But he says, let me find the exact verse here. Verse 4, turn Lord, rescue me, save me because of your faithful love. And then verse 5, for there is no remembrance of you in death. Who can thank you in Sheol, in the place of the dead? He said, I want to publicly praise you. And I can't do that if I'm laying in the ground. So there's a great lesson point right there. When we ask God for mercy, and we all ask God for mercy, we all face those times when I'm just out of sight myself. I can't handle this. I can't see a way out. I am destroyed. God, because of who you are, I want you to do this. Not because I'm special, but also I want to publicly praise you. 
Now, when God does show you his mercy, how many, and this is not a show of hands, this is a rhetorical question, this is a thinking in your head, how many of you then have gone about publicly praising God for what he did for you? You know how, what generally happens? We say thank you in private and nobody else gets to know about it. Nobody gets to know about it. You know one of the greatest things going is when you turn around and praise God and tell everybody, I was outside, I had nothing left. And then God's mercy. And you start telling everybody about it. You know what that does for them? Fills them up. Makes them grow. It establishes their faith even more. He says, God, this is what I want to do. Yes? Uh, at this point, had David done something that truly he deserved death? Well, he was at this point, there, and the, the guest work is one of the earlier psalms that he wrote. He was still running from Saul and sur surrounded by Saul's guys. He's got a few hand-picked men, and death is, if they find him, death is imminent. Yeah, that's his position. He's running, hiding in the hills. He's got no place to stay. The king and his entire army are hunting him down. And if they catch him, he, it's over. So yeah, he's got, he doesn't have a house, he's got nothing. No. No, that would be nice. That would be helpful. They're not. They are lumped together in groups. Um, you have your Psalms of Ascension that are about Psalm 120 through Psalm 134, 135, something like that, that the people all sang going to Jerusalem and on their way back down. So they're kind of put into, basically Psalms break down into three books, if you would, but no, it would it'd be very helpful if they were. Um, but this is one of his times, he's not king, he's surrounded, he's, he's in trouble. In verses 6 and 7, we see, in fact, how bad off he is. That he is exhausted. His sorrow is such that he can't even go to sleep. I know some of you have experienced that. Let me just read verses 6 and 7 again. I am weary from my groaning. With my tears I dampen my pillow and drench my bed every night. My eyes are swollen from grief. They grow old because of all my enemies. Have you ever been in a situation like that? Things have gotten so awful. And you just seem so bleak, so completely out of control, that you can't turn your brain off. You want to lay down and sleep, and your brain is just going, because of all of this stuff. And how am I, how am I, how am I, how am I? You desperately need sleep, and instead, you cry into your pillow and wonder, how am I going to survive tomorrow? Some of the stories that you'll hear tonight, particularly about one young man by the name of Seva, and how he escaped Odessa the day it was bombed with a daughter with severe cerebral palsy. I'm not going to give away any more of the story than that. You'll hear that tonight. And the lack of sleep as they're trying to get way out of the way of one of the most powerful armies on the world with a daughter that can't walk. All right, I've gotten a little dark, so now I'm gonna turn it over to you guys for a minute. What do you do when you find yourself in that sort of situation? Hey, pray. Pray is a great one. Wait for morning. Wait for morning. 
That's all. Uh, that's a, no, I absolutely agree with you. Your blessings are reasons for it. Are renewed every morning. Yes. And we have a song that says, Then came the morning when Jesus was resurrected. So people suicide at that time of night. Oh, they do. When it seems so hopeless. And you know, I've always thought, if you would have just waited for one more sunrise. Yeah. Then at least another set of possibilities. Mm -hmm. Talk to somebody you trust. Talk to, yeah, absolutely. And that would solve a lot of the suicide cases, by the way, which I went on numbers of them when I was an officer. I personally said, God, it's not going to get any better. Take me now. And you know what? That's a common response. I've heard that from believer after believer. God, I'm done. I'm so done. Joe, go ahead and take me home. <laughs> I know God smiles and says, oh, child. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. And if I don't take you home, that's because I got something else for you to do. Yeah. Maybe it's also saying, you ain't seen nothing yet. And that's <laughs> what And you know what? A lot of the times, what God is doing, he said, I'm making you into a giant two-legged bag of penicillin that you're going to go and help somebody else because you went through this. Yeah. You're going to go and take the infection out of somebody else's soul because you're going to be able to hug them and relate to them say, I, I know what you're feeling. Yeah. And we don't like it, by the way. I don't. I don't want to be somebody else's penicillin. God, just take me home. <laughs> I'm done. This is where this this psalm has gone to in these first seven verses. Then in verse 8, look at the flip. The whole psalm just goes, makes a giant 360, or not 360, a 180 and goes in the opposite direction. Starting in verse 8. Depart from me, all evildoers. And some of your translations will say workers of iniquity. I love that term. Define. It's evildoers. And we're going to talk about it here in just a second. I just love the, the language of it. Workers of iniquity. It just sounds cool. Anyway, um, the Lord has heard my plea for help. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies will be ashamed and shake with terror. Who was shaking earlier on? He was. He was. All my enemies will shake with terror. They will turn back and suddenly be disgraced. Look at the flip in this song. It's a 180, and all of a sudden, he's... Anybody watch pro wrestling ever in your life? Yeah. It all follows the exact same storyline every time. It's so real. You have, your, <laughs> you have your bad wrestler, you have your good wrestler. The bad wrestler whoops up on the good wrestler for a while. Just as he's getting down, the good wrestler guy throws him off, rises up after he's just been trashed in the ring, and proceeds to whoop and pin the bad wrestler, and the crowd goes well. Can you define the phrase pro wrestling? Yeah. <laughs> that's your but that's what you see going on here. All of a sudden, David just rises up off of his bed where he's cried all night, where he's not sleeping, where he's shaking, and says, you guys are done. Wow. What a change. So, boldness suddenly breaks through as he addresses his enemies. All of a sudden, he's just a, a completely different guy. He's telling his enemies, you guys are toast. Get out of here. This boldness has only one basis. David's confidence in who he's talked to. He is completely grounded in the Lord's attention that his Lord's mercy is coming his way. So, Harry, do you think you have taken a Probably. He's looked at the situation. So I can't control this. I can't control this. I'm crying all night. I can't even sleep. And then all of a sudden, it, God reminds him, hey, I've got this. It reminds me of uh, Joshua, Elijah. Elijah. There's fact is there's guys all through the Bible that don't think about Peter stepping out of the boat. As soon as he looked at his situation, what happened to it? Elijah, Elijah does it. Jonah, Jonah does it. 
all these guys do it. So again, it's, it's that repeating of the story again and again. And it happens here to, David's, to David. And it's all based on God's ultimate intervention in his life. So again, class participation. I want you guys to actually answer some here. Why do you think that David's attitude changes so dramatically from verse 7 to verse 8? What's that? He's seen the light. Yeah, he's God's edge of prayer. He's seen the light. What else? Conversation with God. Conversation with God. Who is, who's he been talking to? Sometimes something just comes over you. You know, it's the Holy Spirit kind of filling you up and saying, you know, giving you that that confidence in God. And uh, you know, I'm sure you have a good dose of that right there. I can't tell you how many times I've, I've got the feeling of God says, okay, all right. Are you done now? Yeah. The reality. Yeah. Are you done? Because I, I don't want to get involved until you're done. When you're done, then, you know. <laughs> yeah. Let me know and let me show you what I'm going to do. He has no, he, identified the fact that without the Lord, he's helpless. Absolutely. And now he realized where my help comes yeah. from. He is humble enough now to be helped. Absolutely. And look at the confidence. Harry, Gene and I faced a situation you know, a year or so ago, um, and I called on some of the men of the church to, to talk to them and, and for the, their input. And um, we sat at Jeff's house and talked, and the confidence that the God gave, the godly wisdom, it's, it knocked you down. It's pretty amazing. When you were saying just a minute about God waiting for your pity party to end, you know, that's kind of like, like Job, when Job's going at God, and he just waits, and then God just lays it out and so puts him in his place to where he's like, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. You're right. All right, so that's Psalm, that's Psalm 6. We still, I got to pick up the pace here a little bit. Jesus quoted this psalm, by the way. This is Jesus in the Psalms. Again, I want to show you why studying the Psalms is way so cool. And why one of the points that I'm hoping you'll get out of this summer series is I want to go back and study all of them. So, let's go take a look at Jesus' use of this Psalm 6. Um, I have a reader. Matthew 7.23 is where he quotes from Psalm 6. Matthew 7.23 Yes, ma'am. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Ye that work iniquity. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. He's quoting from Psalm 6. Particularly from verse 8. So Jesus, you, Jesus, uh, this verse is, to kind of put it into context, because again, if you take a text out of its context, it's a pretext. You always have to put it in its context to be able to understand it. There's plenty of Bible teachers out there, plenty of television preachers out there that love to take a verse out of context and lie with it. Uh, I try not to do that because I know who I'm responsible to. Yeah. And it scares me badly. This verse is the closing verse from Matthew 17, 7 verses 13 to 23 where Jesus is teaching about entering the kingdom and this is a part of the larger thing known as the Sermon on the Mount and this is the closing verse in Jesus teaching all of these people on the mountain about how to enter the kingdom of God this is the very last subject by the way that he teaches on, in the Sermon on the Mount. He starts his conclusion right after this in verse 24 of Matthew 7, as he then concludes all this fantastic teaching known as the Sermon on the Mount. And this verse fits right, right into that, that part. <laughs> now, just prior to this, Jesus has talked about the narrow gate and the difficult road in comparison to the wide gate and the easy road that leads to destruction. Because remember, he's, he's teaching on entering the kingdom, how to enter the kingdom. He's cautioned his audience big time. 
uh, to be on guard against false prophets. And he said, here's how you can identify them. Look at what they produce. Do they produce Lear jets for themselves? Monster mansions in gated communities? Staying in five star hotels as they go about the country? Healing people? You can identify them by their fruits. Then we read in verse 21 what I think is one of the most frightening passages in Scripture. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. You mean not re people with really sincere beliefs? who've been a really sincere, good person, who have tried to live their life by good standards and just believed in a different faith base, God certainly will end honor that because you were a good person and you tried and you were very sincere in your belief. I have relatives who say that. Who I laid out the plan of salvation point by point. And said, well, I just can't accept that. Still pray for them. They're still alive. God's still got time. But not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. This is all in this same teaching right before we get to verse 23 where he quotes Psalm 6, verse 8. Jesus tells what the false prophets and fake believers are going to uh, argue at the day of judgment. Particularly in verse 7, uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 22, right before he quotes this, he says, here's what, they're going to, here's what their argument's going to be. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we drive out demons in your name? And didn't we do many miracles in your name? What is that all going to look like? Look at what they were doing. Well, it's their perspective of driving out, you know, demons. And, you know, they may not have really done it, but they think they have. Well, even if they have done it, isn't that pride? Absolutely. I, look what I did. Not look what God did. Not what I did to Jesus. But I'm really great. I mean, yeah. Didn't look what I did. Wasn't I a good person? Didn't I do good works? They did it so they can insert their own names. Pretty much. I even wrote a book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then Jesus responds in verse 723 where he quotes Psalm 6-8. And his response is that they didn't have a relationship with him. He said, here's the true key. You didn't know me. You did not call me who I am. We didn't have a relationship. And then he calls them lawbreakers. Or my favorite phrase, Workers of iniquity. I actually told that to a suspect one time, which was fun. <laughs> Had no concept of what I was saying. I like to do that from time to time because the quizzical look on their faces. I had one suspect tell me, I don't know what you just said to me, but I probably don't like it. <laughs> well, look it up when you get out of jail. <laughs> Even though they had obviously done a lot of really good stuff from a human perspective, what law is Jesus apparently saying they violated? The first one. Lord Absolutely. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. Excuse me. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God 